Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Matthias Fernengo, Professor of Economics at Bucknell University, Pennsylvania, USA. We talk about John Maynard Keynes and his contribution to economic theory, from demand-side policies, his thoughts on government intervention, as well as animal spirits. We also talk about how monetary economic theory gained popularity and why governments in the 1970s and 80s adopted policies of monetary economic theory in favour of Keynesian economic theory. Professor Fernengo also explains the difference between demand-side and supply-side policies. You can find all the links, books and resources mentioned in this episode at economicrockstar.com forward slash Matthias, M-A-T-I-A-S. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. By the 1920s, he made a, a name as an important economist writing against the Treaty of Versailles right after you know, the First World War, suggesting that the reparations that the Allies were imposing on, on Germany were too heavy and that would lead eventually to crisis, given the possibility of paying back and eventually resentment and perhaps even another war. So he was uh, certainly right on that. There is, I think, a fairly reasonable acknowledgement uh, that Keynes uh, dealt with those psychological issues. He, he does refer to that, uh, particularly in Chapter 12 of the General Theory, issue, you know, animal spirits and, and how the state of long-term expectations with regards to investment were central to the determination of output and employment. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. I am so honored to have Professor Matthias Fernengo join me today. Hi, Matthias. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Matthias Fernengo is Professor of Economics at Bucknell University, Pennsylvania, USA. Dr. Fernengo is co-author of Conte de Juros Grande a Favela and has also edited four books, including Banking, Monetary Policy, and the Political Economy of Financial Regulation, Essays in the Tradition of Jane Darista. He has published over 50 academic and popular articles and contributes to the blogs Naked Keynesianism and Triple Crisis. He is also the co-editor of the Review of Keynesian Economics. Matthias's methodological view emphasizes the importance of the history of ideas for the development of economic theory and is based on a surplus approach of the classical political economy authors and Marx and the heterodox followers of Keynes. Dr. Fenengo has written on the effects of external liberalization in Latin America and alternatives to the Washington Consensus, on the international role of the dollar, on current monetary and fiscal policy, on macroeconomic policy during the 1930s and on the history of economic ideas. Matthias, I'm very interested in your blog, Naked Keynesianism. And for those of us who do not have as much exposure on Keynes, who is John Maynard Keynes and what economic theories does he represent? So Keynes was at the center of, of economics, uh, in a sense. So the, there is a supposedly a saying that... Uh, from that time, from the early parts of the 20th century, that if time was a device to preclude everything happening at once, space was a device to preclude everything happening you know, in Cambridge, because all of economics was in Cambridge. Uh, and fundamentally because Marshall was the sort of central figure of economics at the turn of the century, of neoclassical economics. And Keynes' father was a close colleague of Marshall, and, and Keynes was educated in economics, uh, basically at home, in between conversations of his father and, and Marshall and, and Pigou. And he studied economics, although his tripos was in, in math. And so he was at the center of the teaching and the thinking of economics. Then he worked for the India office and for the treasury uh, during the First World War. His first book is on India. So by the 1920s, he made a, a name as an important economist writing against the Treaty of Versailles right after you know the First World War, suggesting that the reparations that the Allies were imposing on, on Germany were too heavy and that would lead eventually to crisis, given the possibility of paying back and eventually resentment and perhaps even another war. So he was uh, certainly right on that. 
And throughout the 20s, he writes essentially a series of, of books in which he, he starts to rethink economics as he was taught. And the reason for that is that England, whereas the U.S. had a very prosperous, even if it was sort of on a fragile basis, it was sort of a bubble. The U.S. had the roaring 20s. England didn't have a roaring 20s. In, in, in the U.K., the economy sort of uh, never quite recovered from the war. And there are a series of missteps in the policies, including the return to the gold standard, which was done by the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the time was Churchill. And Keynes wrote a famous pamphlet called uh, The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill. Uh, and several other criticisms had before the Depression. In looking at the problems with this, he also wrote a pamphlet in favor of public works to get the economy out of our, you know, the depression, the beginnings of the depression, in favor of Lloyd George, the liberal candidate. Uh, famously, you know, the, the pamphlet was called Can Lloyd George Do It? So he was a public figure, a public intellectual. Everybody knew who Keynes was, in a sense. He could write letters to Roosevelt, you know, telling him what he thought should be done, and that would be published in the New York Times. He would be the Paul Krugman. Yeah, but probably more well known in a sense of his time, and 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 the essence of the what make him a thing great and establishing a, a school of thought is that by the thirties, you know, economics says basically, you know, you know, classical economics, which was the dominant thing, that markets let's do themselves; they produce optimal outcomes and efficient allocation of resources, and that's certainly true also in the labor market. So unemployment is a temporary thing and shouldn't sort of be something that the government needs to be concerned with. It, it resolves itself. And Keynes argues and shows in a theoretical model that with price and wage flexibility, so not due to imperfections, that left to its own devices, the economic system may get stuck at what he called a position of unemployment equilibrium. So it's an equilibrium. You see, it's an equilibrium in the sense that economists think of equilibriums. So it's somewhat, uh, it's a stable position, a position in which the system tends to revolve around. And yet, it's not optimal. So markets may not be sufficient to deal with some of the problems of coordination in, in the economy, and, and that opens the space for for the government. And so so certainly that's why he's remembered. There are many other things. So so his career then after that goes to be relevant during the Second World War and then the reconstruction after the war with the plans at Bretton Woods and, and the international monetary system. So there are many facets that would make him a, an important uh, figure, but fundamentally the idea that uh, markets sort of fail even when they work perfectly, so to speak, is you know, the hallmark of what Keynesian economics is all about. Just going back on your previous point there where you mentioned that labor markets are not efficient or in a way suboptimal, that they don't end up, even though you called it a, an equilibrium, they're still unemployment. Yes. That's well, what he brought about his thinking because it goes against the theories that he had studied under, was it Marshall or Pigou? Yes. You know, that, that doesn't make sense in that we are all taught, even to this day, that under the classical theories that markets remain if they're in equilibrium, that almost is a perfect outcome. Sure. But this, yeah. So so th that is true. And and there is a secret story of how we got back to this kind of stuff. And, 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 and the teachings were never quite understood. And, and the, the, the so-called Keynesian revolution is aborted very early on. Uh, there is a process of what John Robinson called the bastardization of Keynes. So Keynes basically tells you, you shouldn't be looking at the labor market per se to think about unemployment. You know, the, the many reasons uh, that he discusses in his book for that. But uh, but centrally what he says is, look, uh, workers, they need to find jobs. So they're willing to work for a very wide range of wages. And so the decision really to, to hire workers is fundamentally in the hands of, uh, of firms. And they will do that uh, on the basis of uh, what they expect the aggregate demand of the economy to be. So if there is no demand forthcoming, there is no reason why they're going to hire workers. And so the system is fundamentally demand-driven, and what determines the level of employment, as you see, it's not necessarily a labor market per se, but it's the demand for goods. So if there is no demand for goods, no reason for the firms to hire workers uh, to produce those, those goods. So Keynes fundamentally says, forget the, the labor market. And, and there are other good reasons that, that modern theory has sort of, you know, labor markets give an impression of homogeneous labor that we all you know, are maximizing agents in some sense, looking at utility and so leisure time and, and, and pay. 
And many of the decisions are not about that. Keynes hints at certain things. He, he hints at ideas that people are more concerned with relative wages. So, yeah, you, you quit a job not so much because your wages are lower. So, if, you know, traditional theory says, you know, they pay you low, you know, lower wage, you, you know, you supply less labor. And, and, you know, and that's why you have an upward sloping sort of supply of labor curve there. And Keynes said, yeah, really, that's not the reason. I mean, the reasons are, you know, if you think from a behavioral point of view is, oh, they gave a raise and a promotion to that other guy. So, you know what? I'm, I'm going to find another job that's more suitable for me and that kind of stuff. So relative wages uh, tend to be more important for the decisions to work. But most people don't have that luxury anyways. You know, markets are segmented. It depends on your skills and your education. And and so most people, uh, you know, if they're reduced their wages rather than working less because, oh, you know, I'm going to take more leisure time, they simply, you know, have to find a second job. So, but by the way, neoclassical economists, to this day, there are a few neoclassical economists that suggest that uh, the reasons for the Great Depression are associated to choices of people. So people decided not to work. So Robert Lucas, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, suggests that there is no such thing as involuntary unemployment. So okay. again, a Keynesian concept. The idea is that if people are not working, it's essentially because they are not accepting uh, a lower wage. So it, it's a choice. And you know, one can think of in, in that sense of the Great Depression as being a great vacation. People decided to take time off because wages were not uh, high enough, which is a Patently preposterous sort of explanation of, of the Great Depression. Uh, Lucas himself, I should say, when he has to explain the Great Depression, he goes back to Friedman's idea. It's not necessarily a good explanation in my view, but it's the idea that the Fed caused the Great Depression by contracting money supply. Would there have been social welfare benefits in the 1920s whereby people who would see more of a benefit be unemployed when there was a lower wage? Because that persists today. Sure. Well, uh, there were limited programs. Uh, in the U.S., there were some pensions being paid to soldiers of the veterans of the First World War. In fact, one of the infamous sort of stories of the election in '32 is the repression of the veterans in Washington, D.C., done by MacArthur, General MacArthur on the orders of Hoover. And, and that certainly probably made Hoover very unpopular in the eyes of, of the public. So here you have these veterans, and instead of paying in their bonus, they're being, you know, sort of run out of Washington by the army. And in England and in some other places in Europe, there are also small welfare programs, but nothing big. They were relevant in the following sense. Not, not the name, Tedesco Paul and, and some other authors back in the 80s, if I'm not wrong, they have sort of researched the development of welfare programs during the 30s. And one of the conclusions they reach, if, if again, memory doesn't fail me, is that those places that had a previous history of having welfare programs did better at developing new programs and, and being capable of incorporating in the roles the people that were unemployed and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and that helped into getting training and, you know, get, getting some amount of payment and getting consumption going on and so on and so forth. But I don't think that one can claim at that point that uh, welfare programs were big enough as to generate an incentive for leisure time, that that would be a stretch. In particular, you know, we're talking we're talking in the U.S. at the peak of the Depression in the early months of 1933, we're talking 24.9, so 25 percent, effectively one in four workers were were unemployed, and, and, and that would be sort of a stretch. And it's also a stretch to suggest that, uh, you know, there is no involuntary employment when you have one in four. That's why I said tr traditionally con conservative views tend to suggest that it was a, a government mistake so that it was the Fed that caused the depression, more progressive views would tend to emphasize the effects of both the bubbles that were running through the 1920s. So there was a housing bubble in Florida in particular, but, you know, it was more widespread. There was obviously a stock bubble going on in the 20s. There was a consumption bubble in the sense that you have all of these new products at that point that people wanted to consume, Model T cars, radios, refrigerators, and all of those products, a good chunk of those products, cars in particular, start to be sold on credit. So there's a significant amount of credit also allowing for that consumption. And, and with the collapse of the financial system of the bubbles, credit dries up and consumption dries up. And so it's the collapse of consumption associated to really a big bubble that caused the depression, the Fed might have exacerbated things by hiking the rate of interest at some point, trying to kill the bubble. 
but certainly didn't cause the bubble. And, and that seems to me to be the more plausible explanation. One, by the way, that it's perfectly in line with, with Keynes' views of what happened at the time. Uh, just taking you back to where you mentioned that people may have caused, you know, this is not your own words, but people may have caused the Great Depression because they wouldn't take a lower wage. And they should have taken a lower wage maybe to uh, facilitate their, their consumption. If we flipped it around and say in a boom period, in a boom period, you will have a demand for jobs or scarcity of jobs, I'm sure. And you might have, we'll say, an increase in immigration or the demand for immigrants to fulfill jobs. And you happen, you, you see that happening in a lot of developed countries that are experiencing booms. And what happens is that people who are looking for jobs are willing to take a lower cut. So they enter into a black market economy. Would Keynes have anticipated this type of behaviors in the marketplace also? Well, I mean, I'm not sure. Or how does it fit into the models? It, it would certainly, sort of certainly, you know, the idea that in booms you may have more pressure on wages and whatnot, it's certainly part of the story. I, I mean, I, I want to make clear Keynes actually tended to think so. One way of thinking about, you know, classical analysts may say lower wages allow for more hiring of workers and so uh, you have a recovery, but of course, Keynes was pointing out to the point, you know, to the idea that uh, you know demand is connected to some extent to to wages, uh, and this is more explicit than Michael Kaletsky that sort of came up with ideas of you know the similar ideas uh, as Keynes did in the, in the 1930s. The idea that redistribution toward wages tends to be positive for the economy in the sense that higher wages allow for higher levels of consumption. And that leads to more expansion uh, of the economy. Regarding immigration, K Keynes was uh, a 19th century, uh, I, I should say a reformed 19th century liberal. So not liberal in the sense that the Americans necessarily use the word, but tending towards that, to the idea of a progressive. And he never made a transition. You know, he lived exactly in the period where the liberal party in England sort of vanished and, and labor came to occupy that sort of place. He never became a labor person, but I would, I would suggest that probably most of the people that were close to him uh, intellectually, that would be their natural home, the Labour Party. And, and certainly in Cambridge, some of his followers were connected to labor. So, so from that point of view, I, I would say, if you think broadly, that he was a liberal in, in the sense that he was for individuals choosing and having a certain freedom in their own lives, I, I I would very much imagine that Keynes, if he had something to say about immigration, he he certainly wouldn't have been uh, against it. He was married to a, uh, although you know there are lots of issues about his uh, sexuality and what uh, he was married to a Russian emigre uh, dancer, a ballet dancer. So so my my sense is that he certainly wouldn't decry immigration. Mind you, I, I'm not into the issue of immigration economics, but the effects of immigration on wages are highly debatable uh, in economics. There's, there's a whole debate between Borjas and Harvard and, and Card in Berkeley. And the notion is whether immigrants, they, there is a natural experiment that happened with the Marielitos uh, came from Cuba to Miami. And what was the impact of that huge inflow of Cuban immigrants into unskilled wages in the areas where they relocated in, in Florida? And so depending on how you do these calculations, you'll have some people like Borja saying, yes, they reduce wages. And people like David Card say, no, they, they, they don't. My sense of the literature is that if immigration does have an effect on wages, it's, it's small. And there are several other positive things that immigrants do. They revitalize communities and increase the amount of trade and taxes, and they do pay taxes. And they tend to, because they tend to be younger, contribute and make the profile of the labor force younger, contribute to the sustainability of social security. So in, in general, if you look at the profile of societies that are receiving immigrants, they tend to be prosperous. So, so receiving immigrants is not necessarily a bad thing. And I would be surprised. Uh, I, I don't think Keynes had anything significant to say. But I would be surprised that, you know, that you can sort of be a Keynesian and be sort of against immigration. Correct me if I'm wrong, but did Keynes thinking go out of favor around the 1970s, 80s in favor of, say, monetary economics? Because there's always that debate between, say, demand side and supply side economics. Firstly, if you want to briefly explain the difference between the two, what affects the two? And why can't economists agree that maybe demand side can work on one occasion and supply side another? 
Yes, you're right. Uh, this this late sixties, early seventies is the time at which uh, sort of uh, the the Keynesian, it, 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 exactly at the time, more or less, than Richard Nixon was saying, we're all Keynesians now. It was the time in which Keynes uh, was going you know, out of favor, and Milton Friedman and, and monetarist ideas were becoming more popular. And and in part that is associated to the acceleration of inflation in the late 60s and particularly in the 70s with the two oil shocks. And, and so the concerns with unemployment that in the 30s had sort of made Keynesian ideas very relevant for policymakers by the 70s seem less interesting, given that the main concern of many people, politicians, including because the middle class would, you know, sort of vote on their pocket and the pocket implied not necessarily unemployment. Uh, you know, unemployment may have been higher, but for the most part, the the white middle class in the U.S. was sort of protected. It was inflation, and so so that was the issue. So, what's the difference up to the 1950s and 60s? This sort of version of Keynesian economics that came to dominate in the U.S. associated to to MIT, and and the key figure here was Paul Samuelson. They 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 basically suggest that the government can sort of manipulate fiscal and monetary policy and get the economy close to full employment. And somewhat, you know, and, and several of these, these economies were associated in particular to the administrations of, of Kennedy and, and, and Johnson in the 60s. So uh, Paul Samuelson himself, but several people that eventually got Nobel Prizes, Bob Solo, Samuelson did too, uh, James Tobin, and many others. So I, I think the quintessential economist of, of that uh, sort of group was Okun, Arthur Okun, who, who was with Lyndon Johnson, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. And, and there is a famous law in economics, Okun's law, that is associated to him, which says that if you increase growth by, well, at that time, 3%, you reduce unemployment by 1%. More traditionally these days, it said if you increase uh, out, you know, growth by 2%, you reduce unemployment by 1%. So you see that if you play fiscal policy and monetary policy to accelerate growth, you can control and bring unemployment to the level you want. And then in 1968, Milton Friedman says, well, you know, this is not possible. If you do that, we're going to have lots of, lots of inflation. Why? Because if you try to bring the unemployment rate below a certain level, its natural level, which is associated, in his view, to the equilibrium in the labor market, so the you know, traditional neoclassical idea going back to pre-Keynesian economics, then what you'll have is too much demand. And you know, too, too much demand means you know, too much money chasing too few goods, and you're going to have uh, inflation at the end. So uh, the idea is the government spending too much money on these social programs, all of this stuff that Lyndon Johnson is doing, the war on poverty, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and you know, if you keep spending money, and then Vietnam War, so if you keep running deficits, they're going to print money eventually, and that would lead to inflation. And lo and behold, by the 70s, you have inflation. And many people thought, oh, Mr. Friedman was right. So there is a supply limit to the economy, and the supply is important, and so on and so forth. And you can have the view that you suggest that, look, you know, so there is a supply constraint, but you know, the system is also somewhat driven by demand in the short run. That's the notion. So Keynesianism would be sort of constrained in the short, you know, to the short run. But you know, in the long run, you have to deal with this sort of natural rate of unemployment. The problem with that notion is that, uh, so first, from, from the empirical point of view, what happened in the 60s? I think uh, that Friedman's, um, Friedman was lucky, but uh, ultimately what explains the acceleration of inflation in the 70s has little or nothing to do with uh, with the fiscal expansion of, of the 60s, in my view. So so it was the devaluation of the dollar, uh, you know, after 71, the combativeness, the organization of labor, which was not just associated to, to the situation in the labor market, which was clearly close to full employment, but also to a series of social changes that have strengthened the ability of workers and society as a whole to demand more rights. So you had women's rights, civil rights, you have the new conflict in Vietnam that led to you know, a significant amount of the younger you know, generation protesting. And, and all of these things made for a more conflictive sort of uh, system in which people demanded higher wages or a bigger share of the pie. So they're cost pressures rather than demand pressures per se. And you have obviously the important thing that it's what explains most of the inflation at the 70s, the two oil shocks. So you have geopolitics, the, the conflict between the Arab world and uh, you know the Israelis and that uh, sort of uh, you know uh, leading into OPEC uh, you know and and the monopoly on oil to to 
to all of these hikes. That, that's not to say that there are not supply limits to the economy and that the economy uh, might hit those. My suggestion is that it's twofold in that respect. I think that, that the economy sometimes hits the, the supply capacity limit. I don't think the late 60s was one of those cases. So I don't think Friedman is right on that. So if you look at the long series of unemployment for the U.S., there's only one point really in which it's below 2%. In 1944, by mid-1944, you have that the unemployment rate in, in the U.S. at some month there, it hits 1.2. That's clearly full employment. You see, everybody is either working for the work effort, and we have huge amounts of women that enter the labor force at that point, or they're actually fighting the war. So that's a situation in which the inflation you had at that point was really high and, and associated to a supply constraint. Because, you know, if you wanted to buy a car, you couldn't buy a car because GM is producing whatever, parts for a plane or for a tank. I don't you know. No. And what the government did, given that circumstance, is try to control uh, prices. So, so they have a you know, price czar. It was John Kenneth Galbraith uh, that you know, was there controlling that uh, firms didn't unduly increase their prices. For the most part, the economy, because the economy doesn't have a tendency to go to full employment, is very rare that you will hit the supply constraint. So the supply constraint is there, but it... it it's uh, first of all, it's not fixed. It keeps moving away, and it, it's very seldom, very rarely hit by the economy. And the reason, and that's my second point that I think it's important and it was missed by Friedman and several of these people, is that let's say that you have an economy in which demand is growing fast. Okay, so so you have the economies of the world in in the fifties and sixties growing very fast. One of the things that happens when demand grows fast. So if you go back to Adam Smith, Adam Smith says the following thing. What, what explains the wealth of nations? And it's there in the first chapter of, of uh, book one of Wealth of Nations. It's what causes the wealth of nations is the division of labor. So a weird you know, 18th century way of saying productivity. So it's not because you accumulate money. It's not having precious metals. What Adam Smith is saying, a wealthy nation is a nation that it's productive. So accumulating lots of dollars like, say, Saudi Arabia because they have oil doesn't make you wealthy. What makes you wealthy is having an economy that's productive, capable of producing new goods and services and so on and so forth. So Germany is way more developed than, say, Saudi Arabia, even if the income per capita in Saudi Arabia looks uh, high. So what causes productivity? What explains the wealth of nations? Then it's, it's you know, hinges on what causes this division of labor. And Adam Smith says in chapter whatever, I think it's three, don't quote me on that, that it's the extent of the market. Uh, in other words, what he's telling you is demand. So why would you produce things better? Why would you try to, you know, accommodate and instead of producing whatever, 18 pins per worker, go and produce 6,000 pins per worker? You know, whatever is the example he has there, the, the numbers are not right. But uh, the point is, you're going to do that if you expect people to demand those pins. Otherwise, there is no reason for you to improve your capacity to produce things. So a lot of, not all, but a lot of the improvement in technology, which think a little bit, the supply capacity of the economy, if you become more productive, moves away. So what this says is, if people are demanding things, the suppliers have an incentive of trying to accommodate. So really for the economy to grow out of, look, China was growing at whatever crazy number, 10% a year. And, you know, the supply limit kept moving away. You know, it, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect uh, them to, you know, they would have had a hyperinflation if they, uh, the supply capacity was not changing. So capacity adjusts to demand. So the problem with having this sort of simplistic view of su it's either supply or demand or sometimes one is the other is that supply and demand have a symbiotic sort of relationship. And the point of being a Keynesian is saying, you know, in some subtle way, not that you never hit the limits, not that, you know, demand solves all the problems, but that in general, the supply side responds to the demand side. So when you have to put an emphasis, what matters really is demand. Not that, you know, you should completely forget about supply. So, so that, that's the essence, I would say, of the difference. Matthias, I think we're kind of evolving in terms of the time period from Keynes all the way up to the monetarists. And I want to know now, where do the neo-Keynesians come in? Do they carry on Keynes' thinking, but kind of spot out some limitations of Keynes and maybe bring his work into a new era of economic thinking? So um, there are many kinds of Keynesians. And so, so there is something called neo-Keynesianism or sometimes neoclassical synthesis 
there is that that sort of bastardized Keynesianism that we yes, spoke yes. about. So, uh, yes. from the fifties and sixties, uh, and those are essentially the names uh, that I, I suggested. So, Paul Samuelson and Solo and Tobin, all very Modigliani, all very you know in England, John Hicks that also got a Nobel Prize, and and so all of those guys were very important and and. And they carried Keynesian ideas, or at least some of the Keynesian ideas, particularly in policy, the notion that fiscal policy was sort of an important tool to get the economy to full employment. By the 70s, as you suggested, that you have monetarism and, 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 and then another thing called rational expectations, which is a stronger version of monetarism that suggests that not only there is a natural rate and the economy has a tendency very fast to move uh, to this natural rate, that you can think of the economy as at all times being in equilibrium, so that all kinds of intervention are incorrect, that fiscal policy is completely ineffective, that monetary policy is completely ineffective, that uh, the only kind of interventions that are relevant are you know, incentives on the side of, say, the supply side. So, so uh, those go hand in hand with the rise of the conservative movement and Margaret Thatcher and, and Reagan and, and those kinds of things. And by the 90s, there starts to be a reaction to these views and, and that's when we get to back to some sort of a, a Keynesian sort of a dominance. And, and, and that school is often referred to as New Keynesians. So New Keynesians would be this sort of dominant sort of position in, in academia, but also in political circles. So both parties, when they have to appoint people, they appoint you know to places like the Council of Economic Advisors or the Fed or the Treasury, they tend to appoint economists that would be uh, seen as new Keynesians. So think of uh, Larry Summers during Clinton uh, as the Treasury Secretary. Uh, he was a new Keynesian. Uh, think of uh, an Alan Blinder. They had him on, on the Fed as Vice Chairman. Then think of Ben Bernanke, who was first uh, in the Council of Economic Advisors and then appointed to the Fed by Bush. So a Republican, but also a new Keynesian, uh, known for his research on, on the Great Depression. And more recently, Christina Romer and Janet Yellen, appointed both by Obama to you know, the Council of Economic Advisors and to, to the Fed, and both are seen as New Keynesians too. So, so there seems to be a consensus. And what New Keynesians tend to say is the following thing. It's, they tend to see that, well, let's say that we assume all of the things that monetarists say are correct. Let's say that there is a natural rate, that you cannot move away from this natural rate for very long periods. Let's say that agents are rational and that there are strong equilibrating mechanisms. What they tend to suggest is that still the economies have lots of coordination problems, problems of information. So it's slightly different than Keynes in the sense that they're not suggesting that the system that works properly gets in a suboptimal position. So it's not an equilibrium per se. It's some sort of disequilibrium, if you want. Uh, but this disequilibrium arise from problems of information, problems of behavior, different kinds of problems. And, and that agents are sometimes less than rational, that there are coordination failures, and that opens again the space in different guise that the original ideas of Keynes, but open space for some uh, policy action. And, and, and that's essentially where the profession is for the most part. I would suggest that at least in macroeconomics, the vast majority of uh, or a, a great majority, perhaps not va vastest, it's too much, but uh, I, I would suggest that the, the greater majority of the people that have political influence, at least, and, and that have prominent positions in academia, uh, have a tendency to have those views. Very rarely you get uh, people that are still, say, hardcore neoclassicals or, you know, monetarists, uh, that would have prominent positions in government and by the nature, probably you know, that they tend to say that governments are inefficient. So, so, so may, maybe that's the that's the catch twenty two there. One of Keynes's earliest work was on animal spirits, and I don't think he got much recognition on it because it seemed to be more about behavioral economics, even though we may not have that used that term back in the nineteen twenties. And he got no credit for it. He concentrated on the, remain of his, the rest of his work on the general theory. But of late, Bob Schiller and George Akeloff wrote a book on animal spirits, writing about and showcasing Keynes' earlier work and something that tends to fit into the, the prominence of behavioral economics today or over the last decade. Was Keynes one of the first behavioral economists out there? And did he, because it was seemed to be less mathematical or more difficult to comprehend because 
we might have believed that people were somewhat, I don't want to use the word rational because it wasn't part of his thinking as such and it kind of crossed over to rational expectations. But how difficult was it back then to try and entertain that to people, especially in academic circles compared to today? There is, I think, a fairly reasonable acknowledgement uh, that Keynes uh, dealt with those psychological issues. He he does refer to that, uh, particularly in Chapter Twelve of the General Theory. He should, you know, animal spirits and and how the state of long term expectations with regards to investment were central to the determination of output and employment. So so I, th- I think that, that that was well acknowledged. There was a whole group of economists early on, people like. Uh, uh, shackle in England that uh, sort of emphasized that, and then a group of uh, paradox economists uh, around Paul Davidson that emphasized the idea of uh, uncertainty, expectations, and animal spirits, and those are often referred to as post-Keynesians. And as you correctly point out, they, these have been sort of picked up by Yakerlof and, and Schiller and, and the whole idea of animal spirits, and, and they have a more recent book in which they continue to explore these ideas of behavioral economics and efficient for fools. Again, the idea that markets, you know, people don't behave in ways that, that are rational in, in the substantive way that economics tends to think, you know, uh, objectives and means and, and so on and so forth, so that people can be fooled and, and be somewhat irrational. It's a possible representation. You know, the thing about a, a writer like Keynes, that there's there's more than one facet to his work. And certainly, it, I think it's fair to say that he was yeah, it's somewhat open to what we, we would call these days behavioral economics. M- mind you, I should say also, he, he was trained in mathematics and, and his fellowship dissertation is actually on probability and eventually was published in the 1920s as a treatise on probability. So so he was well versed in in the math of his time and, and had conversations with people that, you know, uh, Ramsey, you know, a mathematician there that, you know, published in the Economic Journal a paper that, uh, you know, while Keynes was the editor, which is the basis of mathematical theories of growth that uh, arise from the 60s onwards, which are very anti-Keynesian, I should say, uh, in many, many aspects of them. But he was fully trained uh, to comprehend those things back in, in the 30s when most economists were. And so, so Keynes had more training in mathematics than, say, Schumpeter, Although Schumpeter loved the idea of mathematics and economics, and Keynes was more skeptical. So, so it wasn't lack of knowledge. It was more of a certain type of skepticism about its relevance in certain contexts. Having said that, and, and, and also saying that I, I'm sympathetic to the idea of suggesting that people are, you know, the rationality is a complicated thing, that sometimes uh, there are things that are procedural rationality and stuff like that, and, and that markets do fail. And, and as much as I, I think that that's the, uh, an interesting sort of way of looking at this, I don't think that that's what, what truly Keynes thought. So Keynes also, one would read him carefully, you know, there are certain things that he says. He says, for example, that he thinks that the idea of a natural rate of interest, which would be the rate of interest that equilibrates investment and savings in a capital market, you know, you know classical theory. Uh, he says, that's a terrible idea. That's not what really... Uh, happens and we should abandon the idea of a natural rate. So the idea is that markets, you know, with people, you know, uncoordinated people acting rationally, reaching this sort of equilibrium, that that natural, you know, that that's sort of a natural state of the economy, and we gravitate to those optimal levels. But he says uh, the, what really prevails is what he calls the normal rate of interest, and he says it's highly conventional, not psychological, conventional. So Keynes was thinking more in terms, although he. Clearly had read Freud, had understood that there are lots of psychological things that are important for the economy, that animal spirits play a role. He also understood that there are certain things that depend on institutions and that conventions are ways by which people tend to behave and and that those institutions are worth understanding and that uh, you know not everything can be sort of understood as you know simply animal spirits and psychological fads and whatnot so Maybe there is a way of reading Keynes that makes him uh, or the foundations of his thinking to be based not so much on psychology and, and, and behavioral sciences, but on older traditions in economics, going back to classical political economy, meaning, you know, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, that the foundations of that are, are on, on, uh, on the understanding of social classes, on things like, for example, for the rate of interest, the behavior of central banks and how central banks do arise on a basis of history 
and institutions. Uh, and that seems to be methodologically, at least to me, what the tone of the general theory, uh, at least on, on, on some parts, uh, seems to suggest. You mentioned about probability, his work on probability. It's actually, he has a book on that. It, I say it's an unknown book to the majority of people who recognize Keynes, but it's on my reading list. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he criticized the whole idea of using probability or, or its application to the economy. Well, uh, not, not sure. I'm certainly, you know, this is not my area of research. I have read some of his stuff yeah. on probability and, and a lot of the writings uh, on, on and, and that has been a while, I should say, more than 20 years ago when, when I was devouring everything that was connected to Keynes. But uh, <laughs> so my take is that he is very skeptical of the use of statistics in economics. He certainly wasn't a huge fan of econometrics as it was being developed. And he has a very critical essay on, good Lord, as the Nobel Prize winning economist from the beginning that was one of the uh, uh, you know fundamental founding fathers of econometrics. Now I'm, I'm blocking the name. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking Fritsch, but it's not Ragnar Fritsch. But at any rate, uh, so he s- certainly was critical of that. And there are some debates on, on where his views on probability sort of stood uh, what I think it's relevant from that is that uh, it gives him a sense that what you cannot have is when you deal with uncertainty, fundamental uncertainty, as he discusses in the general theory, you cannot deal with merely with probabilistic sort of uncertainty. So that that, that would be what uh, Frank Knight in the U.S. would call risk. So risk is this sort of thing that it's probabilistic uncertainty. You know? So so you're dealing with something bigger, something that it's completely unpredictable, something you know, in, in the parlance of the days, as it's what Defense Secretary uh, Rumsfeld called the unknown unknowns. It's it's not the stuff that you know you don't know. It's the stuff you don't know you don't know. And the, the economy is prone to having those things. So I think that that's an important insight. And it's certainly central to what happens in financial markets and in, in, you know, in, in the context of things that Keynes was uh, trying to discuss in the general theory. So I think it informs his theory and it's relevant. But I don't think also you know, it's necessarily correct to go to the other end. Some people, because of that, uh, some types of Keynesians are very against all, all statistical work, and 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 that might be a mistake too. So Keynes might have been excessively negative on the importance of uh, of econometrics. I, you know, I. But at the end of the day, I think you know uh, he would have accepted that. Maybe he had some qualms about how it was being developed, but that a certain balance between methods, so that you have the need for some metrics and a need for qualitative historical analysis, a place for logics and, you know, and thinking in terms that are abstract but not necessarily formalized and for things that can be mathematically formalized. So I don't think Keynes was close-minded to any of those particular methods, so to speak. And so I think in, in, in that respect, uh, you, you can be a Keynesian and still, and still like probability and statistics. Yes, and I'm sure I'd, I'd love to know if he was brought here into the future and saw the power of computers and all the data that's available what is thinking change and i suppose that's reflected by if you want to put a, a keynesian on somebody how they uh, embrace all this type of data and whether to work with it and apply it to their models and that type of thing but I, i'd love to be sp- able to speak to you a lot more matthias like i have on a list to be talking about raul prabish and marina eccles and i know that's the type of work you're doing and unfortunately, you know, I, I suppose the time is running out, but can I ask you a couple of quick fire questions if you don't mind? Sure. I would love to know if you have any writing tips for all of us academics out there or somebody who wants to write a paper or a student who has a paper to present. What, do you have any kind of top three tips you'd like to share with us what you actually do? So I, I suppose one important thing when you're writing is uh, thinking of the audience and trying to present papers, uh, conferences. Conferences are a good place if you're a young scholar to to get feedback. Feedback is an important thing. So sometimes people take long times and don't want to you know, present their work and whatnot. But I think that the, the important thing for young scholars is to get their work out. And so... Uh, Go into conferences, appearing and presenting papers is a good way you get feedback. So other than that, I you know I, I think it's important also to plan carefully when you send a paper to a journal that uh, there is a good fit between the topics you're discussing and the journal you're sending it. And, and a good way of doing that is uh, 
is to see whether you are actually reading the journal. So if you, the papers that come in that particular journal are relevant for the kind of work you're doing, and, and, and that often tends to be a sort of a good sort of strategy to to try to publish in the places you are reading. You know, and, and so so those would be my, my, my two sort of uh, simple tips for young scholars. If you could step into the DeLorean and time travel, and what era would you go back to? Who would you like to speak to and what would you say to them? Oh, that's a tough one. You mean an economist? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it would be a tough one. God knows exactly. I suppose that uh, Marx would be more fun than some of these guys. He liked beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at least you could have a beer with a guy. I don't know. It's, it's a tough question. I taught history of thought for a long while. The history of thought is one of my passions. So, so there are too many economists that I, I sort of like. I, I was lucky to see a few of the, of the economists that, you know, of an older generation that I sort of admired and some that I was curious. I, I certainly would have enjoyed an era in which uh, most people were more progressive and openly Keynesian in the profession. And, and that there's a small window, I think, certainly in, in, in the 30s, in which that's true, probably in places like Cambridge and whatnot. So, so that 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 uh, there are certain places that in which you have a conglomeration of people that uh, were interesting. So, so if you have to say a place that was probably fascinating was the people discussing Keynes' treatise on money, Cambridge, at around 1930. So, so this group included people like Pierre Rafa and. John Robinson and Austin Robinson and Roy Harrod and, and Richard Kahn, the creator of the multiplier, the, one of the key concepts in the general theory. So, so I suppose that I would, I would like to be the fly in the wall of, of, of that room while well, they're discussing the ideas that lead to Keynes' general theory. We mentioned a couple of books during this conversation, but would you have one recommended book for someone to get started on this? Uh, there are too many books. I was planning at some point a post in, in my in my. In my because um, there was a, a post by Lars Seal, a, a blogger that I like, a fellow blogger that I like, and and at some and he posted the ten best books in economics uh, or you know the ten must read books, and I I had some sort of a similar idea of what, what would be the books that everybody has to read, and and so if I made the, the list in my head more or less, I never wrote that post would be the Veblen of 1915, which is uh, uh, on on Imperial Germany. And there is a concept that there is central, a concept of the idea of uh, the country that it's lagging behind has an advantage because they can copy stuff and whatnot, which people tend to think that it's Gershenkron uh, later on. But So Keynes and the general theory uh, and, and Polanyi and, and the Great Transformation. And, and you can think of also uh, Galbraith and the American economy. I would say the, you know, the other two that I think are central, it's Kaletsky's uh, book which sort of shadows Keynes' general theory, and then Pietro Straffa's 1960, The Production of Commodities by Means of Commodity, which I think it's one of the, the two most important books of the 20th century. So I would put uh, the, uh, the general theory as being the other one. And then we can quibble here and there, but I would say there are some works by Minsky and, and Hicks uh, that are also important. So, so that, that's not my full list is as much as I, I thought at that point, but th- those I think are, are all uh, important contributions. Uh, of course, you know, I have things that have influenced me more, but, uh, uh, but uh, so the work by Pierangelo Garagnani and Massimo Piveri and some of the Straffians in Italy that sort of follow from this tradition of putting together Keynes with ideas of the old classical political economy authors. And I look forward to that blog post when you get to write it because you have a fantastic website, Naked Keynesianism. Thank you. So I just put it out there for people to check out that website. And I'll also put the show notes and all the links and books, resources, and anything you mentioned on this episode on economicrockstar.com forward slash Matthias. Matthias, I had a blast and I personally learned a lot from you. Share again with our listeners where they could find you. My my blog is, as you said, Naked Keynesianism. So if you if you put that, you certainly can find me there. And and my, you know, I'm at Bucknell University, so my, my information is out there. So anybody who wants to reach me by email, they can certainly do that. If you put my name, you'll you'll find it pretty pretty fast, and and my papers too. Yeah, they, they they're widely disseminated, you know, in the web. So you can find all the links to Matthias on economicrockstar.com forward slash Matthias. Matthias, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You are an economic rock star. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matthias. Mm-hmm.
If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.